timers in Unity can be used for many things, such as cooldowns, limited power-ups, delays, scores, and more. Today, I'm gonna to show you how we can create a basic timer, ways we can present this in UI, and show multiple ways we can manipulate this timer for different effects. Hey guys, more Blakey here, and welcome back. There's a full package showcasing all of the scripts and presentations used in this video, available on my Patreon, which you can find down below. Now let's get started. So in the scene, as you can see, all I have is a main camera. So to get a timer made, we need to create a brand new script. So to do so, I'm gonna create an object for this. So just right click in our hierarchy, press create empty, and then we can just type in timer manager. And then we can add a component, type in time manager, and then we can just press new script, create an add, and then let's double click to open this up in Visual Studio. So when we're creating timers in Unity, the best way to do it is using a property known as time.delta time. Now this represents the time elapsed in seconds since the last frame, and it's commonly used to make calculations frame rate independent, ensuring consistent behavior across different devices and frame rates. So what we need to do is multiply a float with this time.delta time, and that means we're gonna be essentially scaling this value based on the time that has passed since the previous frame. And this allows us to create smooth and consistent timers regardless of the frame rate. So at the top, let's create a new float, public float timer, and then simply in our update function, we can just do timer plus equal to time.delta time. And this means we are just incrementing this timer by the elapsed time since the last frame. And we're doing this every frame in our update function. So back in Unity, you can see we have this timer value here and it's set to zero. Now, if we press play with our timer manager object selected, you can see our float going up. And just like that, we have a very simple timer, but we can't actually see the timer in our game. Well, first of all, we need to create some UI. Just right click, press UI. Now in the newer versions of Unity, it will prompt you to use Text Mesh Pro. But for now, I'm just gonna go down to legacy and use text. It doesn't really matter either way. And we can just call this timer text. Make sure to go on our canvas and set the UI scale mode to scale with screen size. And now with our object selected, let's press F. And we can zoom out a little bit and we can see our text on screen there. So let's readjust this a little bit. So I'm gonna set it to white. I'm gonna center it. I'm gonna increase the font size and then just scale up this object so we can see our font here. And then I'm just gonna add some placeholder text that says timer. So now let's head back into our script and see how we compare our timer in our script to this UI. So when we're referencing UI, we need to use the Unity namespace. Let's do using Unity Engine dot UI. And then let's get a reference to our text object. So we can just do public text and then we can call this timer text. And then in our update function, we can just set our timer text dot text equal to timer. You can see just this alone, we are getting an error and you can see that we cannot convert a type of a float to a string. That's because this is a string object and this is a float. Luckily, C Sharp has a very simple fix to this. So at the end of our timer, we can just add the dot to string and then brackets and a semicolon. And now our timer is being converted to a string. So let's drag our timer text into this box here. And now when we press play, you can see we can see our timer. But you may also notice this is very ugly and we have a bunch of extra numbers on the end. But we can change this. So you can see in our code, we have these two brackets here as part of this two string. And what we can pass in here is something known as a format specifier. And what it does is in the name, it provides instructions on how the value should be formatted, such as the number of decimal places in our case. So we're essentially passing a string argument to define how this number should be formatted. So to do this, we use quotation marks and then we use F and then we use a number to represent how many decimal places we want. So in our case, I can just do two and then save this. And now you can see we only have two decimals here. This does look a little bit better. And we could even pass in F zero here to make this a whole number. And now we have a simple timer that includes no decimals. So we have what we want now, we have a timer. How can we utilize this timer in different scenarios? I wanna show you how we can manipulate our timer because that's gonna come in pretty handy later on. So I've just made a very simple UI slider, which you can do by right clicking on your canvas, going to UI and then slider. And currently I can drag this slider and it won't do anything. But what we want to do is have this slider directly adjust how fast our timer moves. So for example, if our slider is down to here, then our slider will move at a normal speed. But if it's all the way up to here, then our slider will move very quickly. In our script, let's get a reference to that slider. Let's do public slider multiplier slider. And now in our start function, let's get that multiplier slider and set the minimum value to one and then the maximum value to something like four. And now where our update function is, what we can do is multiply this time.delta time by our multiplier slider dot value. And you can see it says the current value of the slider. Now let's reference that slider by dragging it in. And you can see when this slider is set to its minimum value, our timer moves as it should, but as we increase it, the slider gets faster and faster. And when it's set to its maximum value, our timer is multiplied by four, so it's moving four times as fast. And you could make it slower than its normal value by setting the minimum value in our script to something lower than one, or even pause it. If you set the value to zero, the timer would completely stop in its place. 
we're going to make some functionality so we can completely stop our timer when it reaches a certain number. And then we're going to build upon that to show how we can restart our timer so it will endlessly loop to a number and then restart when it reaches it. And this can be really helpful for periodically doing things in your game. If you wanted to spawn an enemy every five seconds, this is a great way to do that. So what we're going to do, we're going to make a new float and we're going to call this public float time to restart. So we're going to add an if statement. We're going to do if our timer is smaller than our time to restart, then we can pass in this line. And then we can just do else. We can set our time up to exactly the time to restart. Otherwise, it may go a couple decimals over this. In our case, it won't really matter because it is rounded with no decimal places. We wouldn't see a difference. So if our timer is smaller than our time to restart value, then we should increase our timer. Once this number gets bigger than time to restart, then we should set our timer up to this restart value. So now back in Unity, let's set our time to restart value to something like five and press play. And you can see once it reaches five, our number is no longer going up. And while still in play mode, you can see our timer is set to exactly five. And if we try and drag this up, we cannot, as it is being clamped to five in our script. But if we was to increase our time to restart value, you can see our timer goes back up again. So now let's adjust this further. So when our timer reaches this value, the timer goes back to zero and restarts. So what we're gonna do, let's remove this else statement. Then let's adjust our if statement slightly. So we actually wanna swap this round and check if our timer ends up being bigger than our time to restart, then what we want to do is set timer back to zero. And then let's take this line outside of our if statement. And then what we can also do is add a debug.log and inside this we can just say timer has restarted. Now we can set our time to restart to two here. And if we have our console open, you can see every time our value goes above two, we get a new message in our console saying timer has restarted and our value goes back to zero. Now, one other thing you may notice is that there's actually a small pause before it goes back to zero. Now, the reason for this is purely visual. The number is actually correct. You can see right here, when our number does go to two, it instantly changes. But in our game, we can see the number two here earlier than when the number actually reaches two in our timer. That's because when we're converting our timer to a string and we format it to have zero decimal places, what it's doing is rounding to the closest possible whole number. So that means when it gets above 1.5, it is immediately going to two. Now, when we're working with decimal places, that's absolutely fine because the number is way smaller that it's not really going to be noticeable for your game. So in this current case, we don't actually want to use this. So for now, I'm going to select all of this and press Control K and Control C to comment out this code. And we're going to use a different method. So let's do timer text dot text is equal to math F. And if we hover over this, we can see it says a collection of common math functions. And then we can use dot floor. And you can see this says it returns the largest integer smaller than or equal to f. So in our case, we're going to pass in timer. And then similarly, we're going to do dot to string. And we're not going to pass anything into here. It means it's not going to instantly round up to the largest whole number the minute it can, which in our case is perfect. So what we can do to make this a little bit easier to understand is just comment on our code. So for the line below, we can say four timers with decimal places. And then underneath that, we can use four timers with whole numbers. And then we could just swap this from F0 to F2, for example. So depending on your use case, you can just uncomment out this code and comment this out or vice versa. For the sake of this part of the tutorial, let's use this line of code and see how this works. You can see now exactly when our number reaches four, it will go back to zero. And our number only changes when it surpasses that integer. And again, I could combine this with our slider here and set our slider to its max value. And you can see our timer flies up and then restarts at a much faster pace. So with this code in place, I want to show you how we could adjust the color of a sprite when our timer reaches a certain number. So I'm going to make a simple square and in our code, I'm going to get a reference to that sprite's sprite renderer. So let's do public sprite renderer square. And then in our update function, after our timer is set to zero, we can just do square dot color is equal to color dot red. We only want our timer to run once. So what we could do is just disable this game object and disable our timer after our timer reaches the point we want it to. After we've set the color of our square, we could access our timer text and then we can just do dot enabled and then set that to false. And then we could also do this referencing this game object. So this dot enabled also equals false. And now we can get rid of our debug log. We no longer need this. And we can also actually remove this timer here. We don't need this as well. As this code is only going to run once, because once it reaches here, it will disable this script. So now let's reference that square into our sprite renderer. And now when we play, once our timer reaches four, it is disabled and our sprite is set to the color red. 
Now, of course, we still have this slider here, but it does not do anything. And if we wanted, we could have included this in the game objects that we disable. But you can see the different use cases we could have for this. Instead of setting the color of this sprite, we could, for example, lock a door, we could kill our player, and we could do many other things. So that is the very basics of how to make a timer and how we can manipulate this timer in different ways. Don't forget, if you want to get all of the examples from today's video, it will be available as a package from my Patreon if you're interested. I'll thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.